we'll go. Let's get into today. I want to say this to you this morning. You are you were created for a life of greatness. This whole series is about greatness. God never, God never creates you for mediocrity. How many of you believe that? Amen. Never creates you that. You were not created to fail. You were created to succeed. And, and it's never too late for any of us because the grace of God, we can get back on track with our lives at any time. It's, it's not because of our power. It's because of the power of the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. All things are passable. Now, now, the world has a definition of greatness and, and usually that's if, you know, if you have more money, you're great. If, if you got a lot of power, you're great. If, if you're famous, you're great. But that's not God's definition at all. His definition of greatness is leaving a mark on people's life that's godly. It's living your life for the Lord. And, and when you leave this world, you leave it better by leaving a mark on people's life. It's all about helping others. That's one of our cores here at the worship center. Save people, serve people. Found people, find people, amen. And when you get saved, you want to duplicate that. You want other people to know about the love of Jesus. And so I, I'm going to tell you this. Heaven is going to have some pretty great people that this world never recognized, but Jesus has saw everything they've done. There's going to be, we're going to get to heaven. Someone's going to, I didn't know they did all that. Well, because they don't do it to, for people to know. They do it for his glory. And when we get to heaven, I believe heaven's going to be filled with people like that. But King David We've been talking about David. David left his mark on the world. David did some awesome things, some great things, but he also has some weaknesses that we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about David being a wounded son, and we're going to talk about a portion of David's life that wasn't so good, and we're going to learn something about him, and we're going to learn something about ourselves. Now, David loved his children, but if you read the Bible, you can see David was a horrible, horrible father. I also want you to remember that David had many wives and concubines. We don't even know the number. So what I'm trying to say, David had a lot of kids. He had a lot of baby mamas. <laughs> a lot of kids everywhere, and, and they're running around. And so we know he's not a good father because of a story that we're told in 2 Samuel chapter 13 goes all the way to chapter 18. I'm going to summarize that for you. David had a son named Amnon and, and a daughter named Tamar, and they were half-brothers and, and, and half-sisters. They had different moms, but the same dad. But Amnon fell in love with his half-sister, and, and he was a really creepy, ugly guy. And, and he ultimately forced himself on his sister and, and raped her. And, and the Bible says she was totally, de can you imagine? I mean, she was totally devastated by what had happened. Not only being raped, but being raped by somebody you trusted. I can't even get into that, but it's one but lots of things going on there. And she, she tears her clothes, which is a sign of grief and, and brokenness. And, and her other brother, Absalom, which is her full brother, takes her into his house, begins to take care of her, love on her, nurture her, get her back to as best as he can put her back together. But their dad, David, hears about what's happened and he does nothing. He hears about one of his sons raping one of his daughters, and, and he does nothing. And after waiting two years, Absalom has finally had enough, and he goes and he kills his brother Amnon. And, and then he, le he leaves, and he goes and lives in a city called Geshur for three years. And in those three years, David does nothing. He never sent out a search party for his son. There was never a trial. There was never a family meeting. It, it, there was no conversation. It was just kind of swept under the rug like it never happened. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, like, like it never happened. Um, but we never see a conversation that's recorded in the Bible. But David did nothing. So five years after Tamar, Tamar had been raped, three years after Amnon had been killed, David is still doing nothing. So Joab, David's commander, tricks David into bringing Absalom back to Jerusalem, back home, but David still won't talk to him. He's, he's ignoring him. For two years, this goes on, and Absalom gets frustrated because his sister was raped and his dad's not doing nothing about it. He gets exiled, but he gets brought back and bring, bring brought back. His dad won't even talk to him. He won't even see him. So one day he goes, you know what? I'm going to get somebody's attention. 
<laughs> and he lights Joab's field on fire. And Joab's like, man, what in the world is wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? And David says, why did you bring me home? Did you bring me home so I could be ignored? I was already being ignored. Did you bring me home so that everybody would leave me unnoticed? I was already unnoticed. I want to see my father. I want to see my dad. And so Joab sets up a meeting between the two, but it's too late. Their relationship is beyond repair. You ever heard the old saying, too much water under the bridge? Too much time has passed. David doesn't want to see his son. His son doesn't want to see him. So Absalom hates his father and he has the ability and he turns the whole nation of Israel against his dad, which seems like it would have been impossible because of the kind of king David was. But he turns the whole nation against Israel. David has to flee. Absalom almost gets to David and kills him. David wasn't a good father. David being a man after God's own heart, you know he loved his children, but when it came to dealing with issues, he did nothing at all. And sometimes saying nothing's the worst thing you can do. Sometimes you got to confront it, even if it's not easy to confront. We got to talk about this because something devastated happened, and we can't just sweep this under the rug like everything's okay. And you think you're doing somebody a favor by not saying anything. You're Listen, you're never doing somebody a favor when you can't be truthful. Amen. You hear what I'm telling you? I go around somebody, how you feeling today? I feel chubby. Oh, Pastor Todd, you're not fat. You're not helping me. <laughs> I know I'm big. You got to watch out. You get too big. You start walking, your legs rub together. You're going to start a fire somewhere. <laughs> I told that in the first service. Everybody died. Then you got to go home, put on some powder in there. And then every time you sit down, it looks like a magic show. You know, like, (laughs) but the sad thing is nobody disappears. (laughs) So (laughs) they thought it was a trick. No, I'm just trying to get through the day. I am trying to get through the day. But here's the question I want to ask you today. Why was David such a bad father? Why is he such a bad father? David was the youngest of eight boys. That means he has seven older brothers and he didn't have a lot of his father's time. Or attention. And, and we know for sure he didn't have his dad's favor. And you say, Todd, how do you know that? Because Samuel the prophet is being sent to Jesse's house to go anoint a new king. And in those days, it would have just been protocol that they would send a runner ahead of time to let the house know that they're going to be hosting a prophet, a man of God. And so knowing that, Jesse had a decision to make. One of my boys is going to have to stay out in the pasture and tend the sheep. So he decides that David is the least likely to be anointed king. So he sends him back to pasture. And 1 Samuel says it this way, chapter 16. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you had? There is still a youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. And we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he brought him in. He was glowing in health and had fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Now, let me say this to you. You can't give away what you don't have. You can't give away what you don't possess. If if you didn't get a lot from your parents, you're probably going to struggle being a parent to your kids. Which, which our parents are supposed to teach us a lot about our own lives, how to raise our own children, how to nurture, how to resolve conflicts, how to have values, good morals. A lot of that comes from our upbringing. And, and the problem is, what do you do when you have no one to draw from? What do you do when you don't have a parent that's trying to give you? Is, 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 am I making sense to anybody? What do you do when you don't have that role model? And I'm just saying, I think David spent more time with the sheep than he spent with his dad. And anytime you have a fatherless child, society always has to pick up that burden. And and, and David didn't get much time with his dad. And and according to what I read and how my opinion is this, he was rejected by uh, every male authority figure in his life that we know of. 
I'm not saying his dad rejected him, but I'm telling you that, that his dad didn't favor him. Not like Jacob favored Joseph. Remember, Joseph had that bad jacket. <laughs> the coat of many colors. The only other person that had a jacket like that was Michael Jackson. <laughs> in the Beat It video. <laughs> How many of you wanted that jacket in the 80s? I wanted that jacket. It didn't come 4X. I couldn't get it. It didn't come 4X. It came in, in uh, triple skinny. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to put that thing on, and I, I split that thing, putting an arm in it. But I tell you, if I'd have had that jacket, I'd have had a glove. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> I had a glove, and when I walked up into that school house, and when that teacher would have called my name for Kevin Todd, <laughs> uh, I'm straight up. And I'd have had a hat, too. I'm just, see how my mind works? Y'all would have loved to go to school with me. I'm telling you right now, we'd have blowed some stuff up. But anyway, <laughs> but, but he, you know, J Jesse was just the opposite with David. And we know if your dad isn't a really good dad, then maybe it's a great thing to have an older brother because an older brother can take that role. But David didn't even have a good older brother. I want to show you this in 1 Samuel 17. David got a job working for Jimmy John's uh, sandwich delivery service. It's in the Bible. Read it. It's not called Jimmy John's yet, but it's Jimmy John's. And so he's delivering sandwiches to his brother. And verse 28 says, when Elab, uh, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here today? And with whom did you leave the few sheep in the wilderness? I know you, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You, come, you came down here only to watch the battle. Now, you would think in the middle of a war that's about to break out or in the middle of a conflict that with your brother, you would be a, a little more loving, not knowing if this is the last time you're going to see one another. You would have think there would have been some kind of affection, I would think, but, but after David kills Goliath, they write a song that says, Saul has killed a thousand and David has killed tens of thousands and immediately Israel begins to bond with the heart of David. So Saul now, because David's anointed to be king, Saul loses his mind, he loses his stuff and he goes into these demonic fits. And he's trying to kill David. He starts inviting him to the palace to play his harp. And while he's playing his harp, man, Saul's chunking spears at him, trying to take his life. And then he hunts him down, chases him all the way to the desert. And David's having to hide out in caves and anywhere he can get by with. David didn't get, what I'm saying is David didn't get much of his father. His older brother rejected him. And then the king rejected him to the point he tried to kill him. Every male authority in his life let him down. And, and you can't go back in David's life where there was a loving, caring, nurturing male authority figure that, David, that gave David good tools to work with. He's sitting in the palace and his family is just falling apart. So Todd, is this the reason David's a bad father? And my answer to that is no. The reason David is a bad father is because he wouldn't deal with his pain. He would not deal with his pain. I'm talking about David being a wounded son. And we're talking about greatness. And you need to know this about greatness. Every true great woman or man has to rise above the pain of their past to reach their God-given destiny. If you are going to reach your God-given destiny, you're going to have to rise above the past pain in your life. Can I get an amen? amen. Understand, it wasn't the lack of nurturing in the past that certainly contributed to it. But all of us has pain. What caused David's pain is the fact that he wouldn't face it. He wouldn't deal with it. He sat silently in the palace while his family is melting down around him. He had advisors. He had priests. He had prophets. He had friends. And he wouldn't talk. He decided to do life alone. He would not talk. There is no such thing. People say it all the time, but I'm going to contradict it. There is no such thing as the strong, silent type, but there is the weak, silent type. Strong people talk. Strong people get it out because they know if I don't get it out, it's going to kill me. I've got to get this poison out. How many of you in your life would say you experienced something that was devastating, not just painful, but devastating? And some of you that didn't, that didn't raise your hands, can I tell you the reason you didn't raise your hands? Because you're still in shock and you don't know that you're devastated. Amen. Pastor Todd, can that happen? I'm telling you for sure it can happen. We've all had pain. 
Rejection from parents, abandonment, rejection from our spouses or opposite sex, divorce, adultery, death of siblings, death of parents, family members, abuse, physical problem, loneliness. Everyone has pain. And, and, and here are some common things that people do with pain. Here are some of the wrong ways to handle pain. Number one, we medicate it with alcohol, food, sex, drugs, entertainment, gambling. David's family was full of medicators. If, if you try to make the issue, watch this, man. If you try to make the issue out of alcohol or tobacco or one of those things or something like that, that's never the issue. The issue is people's pain because once you take the pain away, you don't have to medicate it any longer. That's why people, most time we turn to things like that. Something is broken, and so we're trying to run somewhere so we can get out of our reality. Well, how do you know? What, ask an ex-drug addict. I can tell you anything you want to know about it, man. You've got to get honest about your, your pain, and David sat in silence for seven years. He medicated. David couldn't keep, David couldn't keep his pants on. Read the Bible. David could not keep his pants on. He had one man killed just because he had lust issues. Kill somebody. We know. Look, look how it passes down. His son Amnon raped his sister. Do you see how if you, what you don't take care of passes down? And, and then Solomon, bless his heart, Solomon had a thousand wives. You'll know you got lots of problems when you got a thousand wives. <laughs> one to two hundred you can get by with. 500, around 500 got to be the cutoff, right? Like, girl, I know you bad, but I, I am up to here on women right now. And all of them live in the same house, so all of them cycling at the same time. That's why David was a man of war. He's like, go horse, go. <laughs> we got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we don't, that woman's going to start throwing spears at me. <laughs> Oh, pray for me. See how my mind works? I just had that whole episode in my head right there. Oh, so, so, so you're hurting and you drink or you take drugs to numb yourself. You got pornography. You got food. The truth is, is you're not fixing anything. You're delaying your healing. Being numb is not being healed. Our society is full of people who are just medicating their issues. The issue is never alcohol or drugs or food. And the church makes a horrible mistake when we try to make that the issue. The issue is we got broken people. The issue is pain. Here's the second thing we do. We motivate it. Well, what do you mean, Todd? I get busy fixing somebody else so I ain't got to fix me. It's much easier. I could fix you all day long. It's hard for me to work on me. Am I the only one here? It's easy to fix somebody. And so we get busy and you work yourself to death. Solomon is the greatest example. David's son Solomon, greatest example of this. Well, Todd, what pain did, did Solomon have? He was the child of, of David and Bathsheba. Everywhere he went, he was, look, he was a Jerry Springer show just waiting to start. <laughs> he was a scandal. And Solomon had to kill his own brother to become king because David did such a poor job of setting him up to be king. So he had to kill his brother. And he had so much pain in his life that when he becomes king, all he does is build, 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 and do, and do, and do, and build, and build, and build. All he does is stay busy, and, and people from all the world were amazed at what he did. And they came because he was the richest man in the world and had done great things. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is right, and he's talking about all the credible things he does, and this is how he summarized it. Solomon said, it was all vanity and striving after the wind. All the things that everybody around the world came to see, Solomon said it was all vanity and nothing. He doesn't talk about the things he does as being the greatest part of his life. He talks about them in the context of the fear of God and keeping his commandments. That's the summary of his life when it's all said and done. See, being diligent means I've done my best and I know when it's time to stop. Stop. But being driven, drivenness means I can't stop. I just got to be a human doing instead of a human being. And if I stop, the reason I, got, I can't stop, I got to stay busy. I got, because if I stop, the ghosts show up. 
If I stop, all the mess shows up in my mind is going in a hundred different ways. And, and I don't want to be reminded of that. So whether I medicate or meditate, I, I, got, I got to have activity. I got to have this white noise in my life or, or I got to get numb because if not, all the ghosts come in. And, and sometimes we won't even go to our prayer closet to talk with God because he knows he may, we know he may talk to us about our brokenness. And here's the truth of the matter. We're like, I'm going to go in here and we try to hide. I'm not going to go in my prayer closet. I'm going to go in my hiding closet. But here's the good news. No matter where you go, God is right there with you. He refuses to let, not so he can correct you, but so he can heal you. I need some help. So he can make you better. He's not there to destroy you. He's not coming with guilt and condemnation. He's coming with the healing balm of Gilead to make your heart whole again. And he wants you to know you're not in this by yourself. You're not in that closet by yourself. He is there with you. God, listen, God's never read a book on boundaries. You try to hide from God, God said, you going somewhere, I'm coming to. I'm going to get in the car, I'm going to run away from God. God said, I'm riding in the car. He don't rebound, God don't, you got, I'm going to build a wall, God said, And you're like, I worked really hard on that wall. And God's like, didn't you read the Bible when Jesus was resurrected from the dead? I ain't got to kick it over. He can just walk through walls. You're trying to to keep him out. Like Ray Stevens said, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. (laughs) You, You can't keep him out. And he's always knocking. Why? Why don't you let me come in? I didn't come to judge. I came to heal. I didn't come to condemn. I come to make you whole. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? He's a nature. That's his nature. He's a good father. He he loves us and he wants to heal us. He wants what's best for us. Here's the third thing. (laughs) Uh, Meditating it. That means we just sit and stew on it. I know people full of hate that are just stewing on things that happened 20 or 30 years ago. That's exactly what Absalom did. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and and do not give a foothold to the devil. The word devil there is diablo. It means slander. The devil will come and slander people to you in your sleep. That's why it's dangerous for you to go to bed mad at your spouse. That's why it's dangerous for you to go to bed mad at your kids. That's why it's dangerous for you to go bed mad at anybody. You know why? Because the de- you give the way for devil to come in and counsel you in your sleep. It's dangerous. Absalom had a reason to be upset about what happened to his sister. But what he did is he let it fester and he let it fester. And he went to bed over 700 nights letting the devil counsel him in his sleep for 700. What did you think was going to happen? You're getting counsel from, from, from hell. He's not going to tell you to work your marriage out. He's not going to tell you to stand in there when times get tough. He's not going to tell you to say, I'm sorry. How do you know, Pastor Todd? Because he's only got a couple of things he wants to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. So anytime the devil shows up at your house, it's for those three things. But he'll never show up looking like those three things. Because if he showed up looking like who he was, I see you, you'd be up there and say, I see you looking like you're looking. <laughs> He'll never show up there looking like that. He'll look like something you want. That's right. That's right. Because if you knew it was a rattlesnake, you would never let it loose in your house. Am I helping anybody today? Man, I hope so. I hope so. It caused Absalom to murder his brother. Then he went to bed with his anger to the point with his dad that he wanted to kill his own father. And he ran him out of Jerusalem, just meditating it, hating the people who have hurt you in your past. And can I tell you this? It opens the door for demonic oppression. Not possession, but oppression. But here's what great men and great women do with pain of their past. We all have pain. We have all done things we regret. But what great men and women do is, number one, they do this. They face it. You got to face it. One of the greatest men in the history of church is is, is Paul. But Paul didn't start out great. He started out as Saul. In Philippians 3, he's talking about himself, and he says, I was born a true Hebrew of the heritage of Israel. 
as the son of a Jewish man from the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised eight days after the birth, after my birth, and was raised in the strict tradition of Orthodox Judaism. Living a separated and devout life as a Pharisee and concerning the righteousness of the Torah, no one surpassed me. I was without peer. Furthermore, as a fiery defender of the truth, I persecuted the Messianic believers with religious zeal. He's saying everything I did was not a good thing to do. He's the messenger of grace and he knew what he did. He murdered Christians. Paul was the one that watched everybody's coats while they stoned Stephen to death. That was his job. Make sure nobody's coat got stolen or nobody's coat got missing. He watched him get stoned to death. When, when Paul got saved, he was on his way to Damascus to go kill more Christians. He was a Pharisee. When we go to Israel, there, there, there are Orthodox Jews, and, and they pride themselves in the fact that they are descendants of the Pharisees. And, and, and if you know, you would say, oh, you're talking about those people with the black hats and the dreidels? Yes, I'm talking about the black hats and the dreidels. Oh, those people are so nice. No, they're not. They're the meanest people I ever met. They're flat out hateful. Well, Pastor Todd, you're just being ugly. I, call a spade a spade. <laughs> Them people's mean. Damon, am I lying? People mean. <laughs> they mean. Their, part of their Saturday is their Sabbath. If you go through their neighborhood in a car on Saturday, they will take rocks and try to knock your windshield out and knock your windows. If not, try to tip your car over to kill you. That's how religious they are. Are you catching what I'm saying? Paul's saying, I was one of those guys. You come through my neighborhood on Saturday, I'm going to take you out, dog. I'm going to take your wagon wheel out. <laughs> you ain't got no windshield, I'm getting that wheel. I am. <laughs> I'm taking them dubs with me. I am taking them dubs. <laughs> They're mean. And, and so what I'm trying to say is Paul was one of those mean, vicious people. He had a ton of pain. You want to talk about being performance-driven? Because we think we have to work for God's grace sometimes. I, we're still real people here. You don't have to work when it's a gift. When it's a gift, you just receive. Like today's my son's 19th birthday. He is ready to receive. He's going to be disappointed, but he's ready to be. <laughs> Turn 19 today, but you just have to receive. His whole past was totally performance driven. You heard what he said. He goes, nobody beat me out of this. I was the best of the best. Why? Because he was performance driven. He said, I was a Pharisee, I killed Christian. That's not an easy confession for a man whose whole message was a message of grace. You got to step up and you got to face it. Greatness in the kingdom of God. If you don't hear anything else, I say, please don't miss this right here. Greatness in the kingdom of God is not how many great things you can do for God. Greatness in the kingdom of God begins with how many scars you allow him to redeem. That he takes your story and gets glory. That he takes your mess and makes it a message. That's what greatness is all about in the kingdom of God. And, and in fact, 2 Corinthians says it this way. All praises belong to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the Father of tender mercy and the God of endless comfort. He always comes alongside of us to comfort us in every suffering so that we can come alongside of those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them the same comfort that God has poured out on us. Let me tell you one of the things that is wrong with the church as a whole today. If you take a 20-minute drive from this campus, there are people outside here in Lubbock, thousands of people who are devastated, they're depressed, they're suicidal, they're drug addicted, they're alcohol addicted, they're guilty, they feel guilty, they feel shame, they're devastated, and we are their hope. Let me say that again. We are their hope. The Bible calls the church the hope of glory. We sit, when, listen, when we sit silently and we hide our pain and, let not, and we don't let God heal it, not only can he not comfort us, but he can't comfort other people through us. He wants you. Why? Save people, serve people. Found people, find people. David, he... Listen, David sat in the palace. He had his crown on straight, acting as though he had no problem, and his whole family is burning down around him until he decided, I can't hide from Absalom. He came after him. The worst thing in the world we as Christians can do is sit around acting like we're something we're not. 
It's okay to be broken. It's just not okay to stay that way. It's, are you, you at the right place. Being okay is okay. It's just not okay to stay there. I've yet to met the person that came to me. You know, my life was just perfect, and I just thought I'd give Jesus a try. I just thought I'd give a try. If it could get any better. Unless, man, my life was a hellhole. That's why I came to Jesus. Pastor, you shouldn't say stuff like that at church. Well, that's what's wrong with people. Nobody wants to preach truth no more. We want to flower it. My life wasn't, I was a drug addict. I was strung out. There's nothing, there's nothing pretty about a drug addict. Peeing on yourself, vomiting on yourself. That's not pretty. Well, no one talks about that in church. That's because they're afraid if you talk about a church, that people will get offended. Well, let me tell you, everybody's already offended anyway. <laughs> they offended anyway. I'm offended. Everybody's offended. It's on my nerves. Everybody offended. I'm offended. I'm offended. I'm offended. Shut up. Dear God, shut up. You don't ever want to do that? Shut up. That's why I can't be doing drama book. Y'all probably call it Facebook. Nunca. Y'all not sucking me into that. I got novellas. I'm not watching Facebook. <laughs> I got my stories. I got Young and the Restless. I am not getting on Facebook. Pastor Todd, do you watch Young and the Restless? That's my guilty pleasure. I've watched that since I was seven. And I'm concerned right now because Victor is sick. Y'all need to pray for Victor. But anyway. <laughs> and Nick and Adam are fighting again. They need peace in the name of Jesus. Anyway, so the worst thing we could do. In... <laughs> I know Pastor Jackie is not preaching this at Church on the Rock. I know he is not. <laughs> but he knows I watch it and he's my spiritual dad. So he calls me for the clips. I'm just playing. He does not do that. So listen, man. We are people that have been redeemed by Jesus. Let's step up and act like it. We are people that's been made whole. You may not be totally put back together, but you're on your way. And quit hiding. Quit hiding from the inevitable. What's the inevitable? Save people, serve people. Grow in people, change. Do something you've never done. I'm not ashamed of my past anymore. That's who I was. That's not who I am. What I've done is not who I am. My story is God's glory, and I give him all the praise. Listen to me. No one can reach people like people that have been redeemed. And I will tell you this. Never follow a general that doesn't have scars, but our general has scars in his hands and his feet, and he's alive forevermore. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why do I need to get healed? Because what doesn't get healed gets passed down. You'll give it to your kids and their kids and their kids. Second thing great people do, and I'm almost out of here, they forgive it and they forget it. Watch this, Philippians 3. I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his, uh, his, his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend upon my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as, as I fasten my heart to my future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all of us who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to you. Forget those things that are behind and pursue those things that are ahead. Now, the word forget doesn't mean to erase from memory. We can't do that. And, and Paul didn't do that. It means to ignore and not let it have power over you anymore. The mother of all issues as related to our past is all about forgiveness, whether it be our family, our co-workers, our church people. Sometimes church people, the meanest people you're going to meet, they just mean in the name of Jesus. And I'm like, that's not Jesus. That's El Diablo. <laughs> you need something. <laughs> but if we don't forgive God, if we don't forgive, God won't forgive us. And look, let me take it a step further. This is not my opinion. This is Bible. The Bible says in Matthew, Jesus tells a story about a man who would not forgive. And it says that he got turned over to be tormented. When you refuse to forgive, you open yourself to be tormented. And can I tell you something? Unforgiveness is torment. 
Because you live with it every day. And until you let the past die, it will not let your future live. You have to forgive even yourself. You've, you've done all, all kinds of things in your past, but the blood of Jesus washes that away. Look, see how bright it got when I talked about the blood? Isn't that awesome? Dude, I didn't even mean for that. Good job, guys. That is awesome. The blood of Jesus is better than Clorox. Come on, somebody. It's better than a Tide pin. I'm telling you right now. you got to believe that the blood of Jesus is more powerful than your sin, and it is. How do you know, Todd? Because the Bible, the Bible says this, where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Grace is because the power to set you free. Listen, forgiveness, this is a powerful point. Forgiveness doesn't make the other person right. It just makes you free. It only takes one person to forgive. It takes two people to reconcile. Y'all look so good. Oh, never mind. Oh, there you go. Now they're back there. This little light of mine. Anyway. Just because you forgive them doesn't mean you got to let them back in your life, though. You ain't got to let them take another shot at you. There's no wisdom in that. But you can't re- keep rehearsing the pain from the past and letting the devil counsel you over it over and over again, condemning you for something that doesn't have the power over you anymore. Yeah. The best way to get past the past is quit telling the story. Yeah. Every time you tell a story, you add something to it. And then I was like this, and girl, then I told him this, and then I threw him the finger like that, and then I walked off like, what now? You didn't do none of that. If you would have done all of that, you wouldn't still be trying to make up a story. What happened is, they probably did it to you, and you walked away hurt, but you're too, you don't want to admit that you're human. It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. We get hurt. Things have, quit telling the story. Let it go. Don't rehearse it anymore because every time you get madder and madder and you invite the enemy to come counsel you again. Here's the last thing that great people do with their past. They follow Jesus away from it. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will lead you into all truth. What are you telling me? I'm telling you, ask the Holy Spirit to teach you what you didn't learn from watching your mom and dad. Don't get stuck like David did. David had all kinds of people to get counsel from and didn't ask anybody. The Holy Spirit can teach you some things. Freedom comes. Freedom comes when we come to the Lord and we say, I need you to help me. I submit this area to you and I'm asking you to help me. I'm asking you to help me be what I'm not. Can I tell you something? If David would have started there, David would be an awesome father. But he was willing to do the hard stuff. Some, one of the hardest things I've learned as a dad, I don't know, some of you probably know this thing. The hardest thing I've ever learned about being a dad is having to go to my son and tell him I blew it. I'm sorry, dude. I was mad. I was angry. I said some things, and none of that had anything to do with you. It had it all to do with my, my issues, how people had treated me. And now I had you in a vulnerable spot, and because I had you in a vulnerable spot, I took it out on you. Pastor Todd, you shouldn't do that. I I can give you a list of things I shouldn't do. But I'm telling you, one of the, I'm, I'm, I'm not bragging, I want you to catch me. I stink at a lot of things. Not shoe fashion, though. But I stink at a lot of things. But you know the one thing that I don't stink at? You can't beat me to an altar. I am quick to repent. I am quick to go to the Lord and say, you know what, I suck today. I blew it. I said some things to my wife that I wouldn't even say to strangers, and I said to somebody that I'm supposed to live with for the rest of my life. Why is it I can treat strangers better than I treat my own wife? I'll do things for other people. Sometimes I don't do in my own home. I'm off balance. I got to go to the Lord and say, God, I'm off balance. Now, all of you guys are great. I'm glad you're here this morning. But listen, if, if all you guys keep coming, keep coming and I lose my marriage, then what was it for? It's okay to own it, man. It's okay to own it. And this morning, maybe you're here. Maybe you've dealt the pain. Or maybe you've received the pain. Doesn't matter. Because after you hear a message like this, if you stay broken, it now becomes a choice. You have chosen to live this way. See, what some of you can't see in the spirit realm, 
You ever have people say, man, there's a fourth dimension, the spirit realm that nobody can see or some people can see? Can I tell you in the fourth dimension, there are a lot of you that are here this morning in orange jumpsuits. You got your slides on. You got your number on the back of your jacket there. You're in prisoner. You're a prisoner and you don't even know you're in prison. Because of something that happened then is keeping you from walking in your now. And you don't even recognize it. You don't even realize it. But you showed up bound up. But you don't have to go home bound up. You showed up with a number. You don't have to leave with a number. You can leave with a name that nobody else can give you but Jesus. According to the book of Revelation, he has a name for you that nobody else knows but you and him. Mine's probably Megatron, but I don't know that. (laughs) But here's what I'm trying to tell you. Just because you're in church doesn't make you free. It doesn't make you whole. How many got a garage in your house? You ever ever stood in that garage and became a car? (laughs) Coming to church don't make you whole. But coming to Jesus will. Coming to Jesus will. So here's what's on the table today. Freedom. Freedom from being a wounded son or a wounded daughter so we don't grow up like David. And we can change that at any moment and at any time. The best I learned visually, I will go to a movie where people are fighting and blowing themselves up and I will be there bawling because the Holy Spirit is speaking to me in a movie. And one of the greatest movies I've ever seen, I'm I'm not telling you go out and there's some stuff in it that's rough, but one of the greatest movies I've ever learned about freedom is Shawshank Redemption. And in Shawshank Redemption, Red, Morgan Freeman gets out of jail and he gets a job sacking groceries. And he's sacking groceries, all of a sudden, I got to go to the bathroom. And he, boss, hey, boss, bathroom break, bathroom break, boss. And, and the manager is just mortified that he's yelling, can I go to the bathroom? And he walks over to him and he says, son, you, you don't have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. You can go to the bathroom anytime you want to. And Red says to himself, I've been locked up so many years that I can't even squirt a drop of water unless somebody gives me permission to go. What I'm telling you is you can be free and still be locked up. He didn't know that he had freedom. He didn't know San Juanito was waiting on him. You hear what I'm telling you? And what I'm trying to tell you, there's a better side waiting for you. There's a future that is just waiting on for you to get there because... You were created for greatness. Every head bowed this morning.